Stand and worship with us.
Turn your attention to the screen as we check out kind of a funny video this morning. I'm so bored. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look. An empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed. You're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. 
Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull out our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, ah! fight! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. Hey, I'm gonna hop in the shower. Does somebody wanna come use the bathroom while I'm in here? Well, good morning and welcome to the Donaldson Fellowship. Happy Mother's Day. Mother's Day is a super fun day where we get to celebrate all types of mothers. Um, the Lord is so kind and loving to give us all these types of moms to learn from. We have spiritual moms and bonus moms and adoptive moms, birth moms, grieving moms, hopeful moms, single moms, and it's such a joy that we're all part of the same church family and we can learn from one another. One thing that I'm learning so far is that we can't do it alone, just like we can't do life alone. We need each other to support and encourage one another and constantly point us to Jesus. My name is Ellie, and I get to be part of the student ministry team here at TDF, and I'm so happy to see you this morning. If this is your first time joining us, I invite you to fill out the card that you'll find in the seat in front of you, or you can just scan the QR code. And then after service, head to the new here kiosk just out these doors. Someone from our team would love to meet you, answer any questions, and just connect with you and give you a little gift just to say thanks for being here with us. We are halfway through May, which means summer is right around the corner. Summer is full of lots of fun and exciting things for our students, lots of new opportunities and can't miss milestones. Two things that are happening next month, we have high school camp and middle school camp. These kinds of summer camps are a super great opportunity for our students to not only build deeper relationships with their peers, but learn more about Jesus and grow in their faith in him. So I invite you, pray over the students that are going to camp this summer. If you see a student in the hallway, ask them what they're doing this summer. There's lots of fun things happening and they will be so excited to tell you all about it. As we continue in worship this morning, I wanna read from Psalm 73 verses 23 through 28. Yet I am always with you. You hold my right hand, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will take me up in glory. Who do I have in heaven but you? And I desire nothing on earth but you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. Those far from you will certainly perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge so that I can tell about all you do. Let's continue in worship. I know that you will keep you close. 
Stand and sing this chorus together. Oh God, we need you. Let's sing it out. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faith. Yeah. 
We don't bring anything that's going to elevate us beyond anything ourselves. That you are all things. You're mighty and strong, full of power. Both Lord and Savior, both now and forever. And we need you. There's not anything that we need a sign from you. I pray that, I pray that you just remind us of our, our, our need that you have all things. As we come to you, that you just remind us of that. Remind us of your care. And remind us that we need to depend on you, to trust in you. You're worthy of all praise. We bring that this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for your singing. You can be seated. Well, good morning, y'all. Uh, my name's Tommy. I, I get to be one of the pastors here if I haven't met you yet, but I'm, I'm just really thankful that you're here and we get to walk through the word together and, and continue in worship. Uh, we, we started this series called Holy Sexuality last Sunday. We're really asking one central question with this series, that if God created sexuality like the Bible talks about, does he have a plan for sexuality? And if he does, then what is that plan? And so last week we started where the Bible starts, which is Genesis 1, and really talked about that super important question that all of us have. And, and if you've never thought about this, man, I hope that you begin here. Just who am I? We start there because that's such a core question. Who am I? And ultimately, we came to the conclusion that our core identity, according to Scripture, is that I'm made in the image of God. That's the core truth about me, and that that image is, is good, and it's different than anything else that's ever been created by God. It's, it's connected to our objective, God-given, biological sex of male or female, and it even points us to Jesus Christ Himself, our Savior and our Lord. He's not made in the image of God, but Jesus is the perfect image of God, is the way the scripture talks about him. And so we talked about all that last week. And if you want to catch up on that, you can just go online and, and just continue in that conversation with us. But today we're going to talk about how, if that's really true about who I am, that I'm made in the image of God, no matter where I come from, no matter my background or beliefs, I'm made in the image of God. If that's true, then how does God? want me to frame my view of things like singleness and marriage. That's what we'll talk about today. Next week, we'll address all of the, the big uh, but what if 
questions. But what about questions? Like that, that one passage about same-sex relationships in the Bible, doesn't that word mean this? Or what does that mean? Or, or I've always been taught this, but what does the Bible actually say? We're going to try our best to tackle a bunch of those questions next week. And then finally, the last Sunday of this month, May 26th, we're going to talk about the lordship of Jesus over all things and so I'm just, I'm excited to be with you. I'm excited to walk through the word together. I'm, I'm thrilled that you're here. And I guess I just want to make a commitment to you every week that we want to give you some additional resources to investigate just kind of on your own time so that you can uh, just kind of study the scriptures together and so that you would understand what the word says even on your own. And so out the doors and to the left, you'll see an information wall. And we've got a piece of paper on there with a, uh, several resources that we think are pretty significant in this conversation. There'll be uh, things like uh, podcasts and books and tools. There's even like an online cohort that you can join this month through the Keller Institute, which I think is fantastic. And, um, and so check that resource out. We think it's going to be a benefit to you. And then also, I have to mention uh, one of our ministry partners, Lantern Lane. So Lantern Lane is a, a group of caring biblical therapists out in Mount Juliet. My wife and I have been out to see them. Uh, we have people on our staff. They, we, we bring them in for our staff occasionally. We, we send so many of our church family to them along the way because they're really helpful in unpacking who Jesus is, what Jesus would have us to do, who are we in Christ. They just are, the way I feel called to be a pastor, they feel called to be biblical therapists. And so we utilize them, and if they can be a benefit to you in this conversation about holy sexuality, along with those resources, then, then just use all these things uh, for your benefit and for God's glory in your life. So all of that to say, all in all, our sincere hope for this series, just to echo the words of Christopher Yuan, is for all of us to understand, embrace, and celebrate biblical sexuality. That's our hope here. And so to, to understand what I mean by that is, is to finally have answers to some of the questions that you've had maybe for a super long time about what does God's word actually say about sexuality. When I say to embrace, I just mean that you would apply what you're learning to your own life, that you would do that sincerely. And then to celebrate is that you would just help other people that you know and love to understand and to embrace God's beautiful and good design of, of holy sexuality. So all of that to say, we come to this today, knowing that we're made in the image of God, knowing that we are image bearers, how does the Lord want me to frame my view of singleness and marriage? And so I, I kind of want to begin with the core statement that we'll just keep coming back to. I want to give it to you up front because I do think it's the right starting point, but I think it's the right ending point as well. And so I would say it like this, that whether you are single or married, only Jesus has the ability to complete you. Whether you're single or married, the two subjects that we're gonna talk about today, only Jesus has the ability to complete you. And what I mean is that if you're single today, you don't need a man or a woman to complete you. They're not capable of doing what only Jesus can do. And if you're married, don't expect your spouse to be for you what only Jesus can be for you. Now, that doesn't let you like off the hook to like love your spouse well. But you can't be Jesus for your spouse. And so we don't want to pressure our spouses in that way. So my point is, either scenario, single or married, we simply put our lives in the sovereign hands of the God who made us and who truly completes us. That's our prayer. That, that's our prayer. And that's what we'll keep coming back to today. So let's just start with what does the Bible actually say about being single? So maybe... Maybe you can relate to this, but from maybe the earliest storybooks that were ever read to you, earliest fairy tales, maybe the first kids' movies that you ever watched were taught basically to, to idolize marriage. And what I mean is all the fairy tale stories typically end in a way that's super predictable that you know. It's like these two main characters, they get married and they do what? They live. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. We know this story. And, and I'm, not, I'm not hating on those stories. Like, I'm about those stories. That's, that's great. But what I want you to see is that marriage isn't equivalent to happily ever after. We tend to view it like that. Like, if I'm going to live my life happily ever after, it, it better involve marriage or else it won't be happy. And, and so what does the Bible actually say about being single and about happiness? And this is the coolest thing to me, our default gift from God is singleness. Meaning like 
we get to dedicate a child here in a bit, that child, believe it or not, is not married yet. Like it's the default gift in our lives is that we are single. And it is a gift from the Lord. So let, let, me, let me give it to you in, in the way the Bible teaches it. We all begin life single. We'll all be single in eternity. And if you're like, wait, what? Hold up, hold up. And some of us experience marriage in between. So one more time. We all begin life single. We'll all be single in eternity. And some of us experience marriage in between. So this is the way Luke 20 unpacks this thought. Jesus told them, the children of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to take part in that age, talking about eternity, and in the resurrection from the dead, talking about heaven, neither marry nor are given in marriage. So in, in eternity, this is what you need to know, the way the Bible teaches it, is that you will, the relationships that you have now, you will still be known. You will still know these people, but no one, none of us will be married in heaven because collectively we will be wed to the Lamb of God, which surpasses anything else, including our present relationships. Like we will be completely fulfilled, whole, completed in that way. So instead of us on, on this planet, like longing for marriage, or instead of us just longing to stay single, the way the scriptures teach us to have a mindset around this is 1 Corinthians 7 says, let each one live his life in the situation the Lord assigned when God called him, meaning when God saved you. This is what I command in all the churches. So what's that mean? It means that no matter if you're married or single or divorced or widowed or remarried, like whatever situation you find yourself in today, God can work in your life and through your life instead of us kind of giving over to that lie of thinking, well, one day I'm going to walk really, really close to the Lord when I get in that situation. By, by that meaning like when I'm married or when I'm remarried or when, whatever is that situation in your mind. And the way the Lord paints it consistently in the Bible is walk with me well right now in the place that you're already in. Don't wait on some other situation that won't complete you anyway, but the situation you're in right now. So the way Paul says it, 1 Corinthians 7, you should read it later. It's all about marriage and singleness, but the way he talks about singleness, he says it is a gift. It's a gift. So being single is not super spiritual. It is not more special. He's saying it is simply a gift from God. And you can give glory to God in your singleness. So later on in that chapter in verse 35, Paul says, I'm saying this for your own benefit, not to put a restraint on you, but to promote what is proper. And so that you may be, love this wording, devoted to the Lord without distraction. So in that culture, like, like honestly, like many cultures today, ancient Israelites, they wrongly frowned on singleness because in their, their minds, singleness is associated with childlessness. And so the question is, well, well, what is a better blessing than having your own physical sons and daughters? And Jesus tells us the better blessing is having spiritual sons and daughters, if you have physical sons and daughters, you should aim to also make them spiritual sons and daughters. But, but the greatest benefit comes to single and married people that, that we have spiritual sons and daughters. This, Jesus says it like this in, in the Great Commission, Matthew 28. He just says, go therefore and make disciples or make spiritual sons and daughters of all nations. And so if I, if I can just be like really candid with you right now, some of you are single and you pour into my two physical daughters so much. Like you pray for them and, and they're not unique in that. Like you pray for, for many of our kids and grandkids. You pray for them. You love them. You mentor them. You, you, you just spiritually parent them. And I just cannot say thank you enough. It is no small thing that you teach them and that you care for them. It is no small thing. And so I just want you to know like, I'm so grateful, and I know I'm just one among a lot of people who are grateful for you, that in your singleness, you are spiritually parenting. And I, I love that. And so the Apostle Paul, he sees that calling on his life. The Apostle Paul is a single dude. 
And so he, he realizes that part of my calling is to, to have spiritual sons and daughters, spiritual sons and daughters of the faith. And so he disciples people like Timothy and he talks about them knowing that they're like family to him. He says in 1 Corinthians 4, this is why I've sent Timothy to you. He is my dearly loved and faithful child in the Lord. You hear it? Another person Paul disciple was Titus. He said this in Titus 1, verse 4, to Titus, my true son in our common faith. He, he would even write like collective churches, entire churches. He, he wrote to all the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, and he said, for I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So Paul is a single man who is obeying God by making disciples, which resulted in him having spiritual sons and daughters which is even more important than having physical sons and daughters. And he realizes it. So the biblical point is really, really clear for all of us. So whether you're single or married, you are called by God to be a disciple maker who has sons and daughters in the faith. In the faith. And that is such a good gift from God. And if you're single, you get to walk in this. In fact, all, I say all, I believe it's all, but I'm just going to say almost all. Almost all worldviews, besides Christianity, has a negative view of singleness. Christianity has a supremely positive view of singleness because the most prominent people that we read about in the New Testament, Jesus and Paul, are both single. And if singleness isn't good, then Jesus wouldn't be good. And you and I know better than that at this point. We know that he is supremely good. So if you're single and you're content with that these days, or, or if you're single and you say, man, Tommy, I really, I'm single, but I really want to be married one day if that's God's plan for my life. Either way, my encouragement to you is to just live your life with open hands and pray, God, have your way in my life. Help me to delight in you right where I'm at. And help me not to find completion in somebody else when I know that will never happen. Help me to realize I will only be complete in Jesus. That's the prayer. Like that's, that's where we're at. And, and when it comes, you may say, man, Tommy, but what do I do if I have same-sex attractions? Does that mean that I'm, I'm bound to a lifelong marital status of single? Is that, is that the only option for me? And I just... I want to say this really tenderly and really carefully because I, I don't think the Scripture teaches that you have to do that. I don't think the Scripture actually even teaches that the supreme goal for all of us should be marriage. The supreme goal is that all of us need to, to be married one time. That, that is the prize. That is the goal. That is the, the end of the game. That's not it. That's not the way the Bible talks about it. And yet, I, I also don't want to discount the possibility that God can do what may seem impossible to you, Me meaning for anyone to mandate lifelong singleness for those with same-sex attractions, I almost feel like we're not giving God a chance to be God. It's like we're kind of writing the end of that story before God has his way in the end of that story. And so I guess what I mean is, is I, have, I have friends and I have um, just ministry leaders that I know and, and colleagues and and, and acquaintances and super close friends and all of that, 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 that it's not uncommon for believers with same-sex attraction not to fall in love with the entire opposite sex, but for them to say, I have same-sex attraction. And it's not that I'm in love with everyone in the opposite sex, but boy, I found that man or that woman. I just think they're so godly and so special. And I think I want to be married to them. And so I want to be really careful to say lifelong singleness is, is uh, the calling or the, the gift on your life. I, I, I just don't think I have the authority to say that. But what I do think I see really clearly in Scripture is that whatever our route, we are to glorify God. And so I have friends who glorify God with their gift of singleness, and they do that all throughout their life. And I have other friends who that was their mindset, and along the way, they were open to marrying someone of the opposite sex if God led them to do it. And sure enough, they found that person that they said, wow, I just love them, and I adore them, and I just want to spend my life with them. I never thought this would be my story, but here I am married to them. Some of them even have kids, and it's like they, they found 
a tremendous opportunity to be married to a godly person of the opposite sex when they never saw that coming. And so I just think our openness is key, and either way, holiness isn't dependent on our sexual desires. If I'm honest, it's not dependent on on any desires of ours. Holiness is given by the only one who is holy, who is God himself, so singleness, because of that, it really is a gift from God. It really is. And so concerning marriage, um, the Bible begins talking about marriage in Genesis 2, about Adam and Eve, and then it ends talking about marriage, talking about the ultimate marriage in Revelation 19 between Christ and his church. So the Bible is full of marriage talk like it's full of single talk. And, and so if you say, well, what, what do you mean by marriage? Because in our culture, we struggle with that definition. So what does the Bible say? Not you, Tommy. What does the Bible say is a biblical definition of marriage? In a biblical definition of marriage, it is a covenant relationship, covenant, between one man and one woman under the lordship of Jesus, that Jesus calls the shots in that relationship. He leads out. He's the centerpiece, the core of it. And it's a covenant. And you may say, man, I don't know. I don't know the difference between a covenant and a contract. And I honestly think the reason probably many of us don't know is because there's not a big difference except I think the only difference is a person's attitude, meaning a person's attitude in a contract is, hey, I'm in, I'm in as long as they hold up their end of the deal, but the moment they don't, I'm out. If you do it, I'll do it. If you stop doing it, I'll stop doing it. Contractual. It's a contract. A covenant says, hey, I'm in, and I'm not looking for the eject button. Hey, I'm in, I'm committed to you, and I'm committed to this God-ordained relationship. So, so biblically, marriage is a biblical covenant. It is not a basic human right. So when we, when we view marriage equality as some social right, we may not know that we're doing it, but we're actually redefining biblical marriage when that was never our definition to redefine it ever anyway. I never had the authority to redefine something that God defined. And so, so yes, marriage is just this tremendous expression of love. But I want to encourage you to know, I don't diminish marriage, but it is not the highest expression of love. It is not. The highest expression of love is when God the Father sent his son Jesus to die for our sins. So the pinnacle of love is God's love for us in Christ Nothing is greater than that. Nothing is better than that. So, so the question, should marriage be a joy? Yeah. Should marriage be enjoyable and good? Definitely. Oh, for sure. But a spouse doesn't complete you. Only Jesus, again, only Jesus can complete you. So one of the clearest teachings about that, that biblical definition of marriage actually come from Jesus' own lips in Mark chapter 10, and he actually calls back to Genesis. So Jesus says it like this in Mark 10, 6. He says, from the, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become one flesh. So interesting. That wording is interesting. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So do you hear what Jesus is doing? He, he's connecting the creation of male and female, Genesis 127. That's what we talked about last week, right? Our objective, God-given, biological sex. He's connecting that to the covenant of marriage that's described in Genesis 2.24. And so when Genesis 2.24 says, one flesh, that, that Hebrew phrase literally means, it means two words. It means unified and diverse, Meaning that they're the same, but they're different. They're human, but they're male and female. So what Jesus is teaching in Mark 10 is that there is no biblical marriage apart from a covenant relationship between a man and a woman under the lordship of God himself. This is what Jesus is teaching. So when when God made male and female, I just think this is so cool. 
that he had in mind, even before it happened, he had in mind this gift that would be for some people that would be the gift of marriage. He had that in mind. Sometimes Christians kind of get this, this, um, I don't know, this, this accusation against us that we have a really narrow view of love. And I think in reality, the way the Bible calls us is that we should have the broadest view of love of anyone in any culture. We should. It's the way the Bible calls us to. And what I mean is we are called as Christians to love everybody. Like we're called to love our enemies. Who does that? But we're called by God to live a life like that. So, so when it comes to, to same-sex attractions, you may wonder, well, what's wrong with two people loving each other? And the best biblical answer is nothing. Nothing's wrong with that. That's, that's the way we're called to love, but God has a plan specifically for marriage and specifically for intimacy in that way that we're called to, in Christopher Yuan's words, to understand, embrace, and celebrate, while we also are called to love everybody with the love of Christ. But it's that, that definition of marriage, that intent, that creation, that God says, I've got a purpose for this, and it's not vague. So, so all of that just always brings out the questions, that, at least in my heart, and I'm sure in yours, like, well, if, if we get in trouble with things like sex, then why would God even create that? Why does God create something like sex? What's the actual purpose of sex? And so what I want to do, I want, I want to tell you his purpose for sex, and then I want to just break it apart and explain it a little bit more detailed. And it's a, it's a longer two sentences for you, but I want... I asked my wife, I said, is there any way to shorten this down? And she's like, I think that's about it. I'm like, great. So they're just key words that if I left them out, I think I would be doing a disservice to the scriptures. And so let me give you a full definition of sex. And then let me, let me break it apart. So here it is. Sex is meant to be a gift given exclusively to a husband and wife as an expression of their marriage covenant. It's a celebration of their oneness in Christ and a fulfillment of God's creation mandate. I know it's a mouthful. But like, let, me, let me just break that apart and show you why it is so worthy of celebration in your understanding, right? So when I say that, that sex is a gift, what I mean is sometimes you're raised in a, in a way that, that we view sex as dirty or it's wrong. And I don't want you to hear that word sex like that. Because sex is actually a tender blessing. It is a good gift from God in the context of marriage. When, when I say it's exclusive between a husband and a wife, I mean that's why when we date someone, we don't sleep with them. Because, because that is a gift. Sex is a gift given specifically for marriage. It's reserved for marriage between one man and one woman. When, when I say expression, you may go, why would you use that word? Well, in every covenant in the Bible, you see an, a physical expression or a physical sign attached to it. What I mean is like in, in the Old Testament, when, when God gives a rainbow to Noah, it's a, a covenant sign that I will not destroy the earth by a flood. When, when God gives the Passover blood, it's God's covenant sign to the Israelites that I've saved you, I've redeemed you, and that I want you to follow suit. I want you to do what I'm telling you to do in order to walk in my ways. He's giving them a sign. Even in the New Testament, Jesus gives this communion or the Lord's Supper as a sign of his new covenant that we brought about through his broken body and his shed blood. So all of these covenants in the scriptures have physical signs. So marriage is a covenant. What is its physical sign? Sex is the physical sign of the marriage covenant, meaning that it is only within the boundaries of marriage that sex actually belongs. In every other context, it does not belong. The reason we say it's a celebration of oneness, oneness just isn't like a, a less crude way to talk about sex. Oneness is so much more than just the physical. It's this all-encompassing physical and emotional and spiritual oneness that only a husband and a wife share. And when we talk about the fulfillment of God's creation mandate, it just, it, it calls back to Genesis 1, when the Lord says, God said to him, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And so he's talking about giving birth to physical children in the framework of marriage. 
Remember, though, Paul still learns from that passage in Genesis 1:28, even as a single man, because the greater calling is not physical sons and daughters, but spiritual sons and daughters. So he still, he still hearkens to that and says, I want to, to multiply and be fruitful and fill the earth with disciples of Jesus. And so no matter single or married, we still find our Genesis in Genesis. We still find our home in those kinds of instructions. So ultimately, sex is a really good gift within marriage, but it's not the main reason to ever get married. It's not the main reason. The main reason to get married is your love for God and your love for that person. One flesh in Christ. That that is the calling. So I like how one commentator says, before you become one in marriage, become whole in Christ. I like that. Jesus is the only one who can complete you if you're married. He is the only one who can complete you if you're single. So like Jesus, the Apostle Paul, believe it or not, he also quotes Genesis 2, 24 as this foundational text for marriage. This way he says it in Ephesians 5, 31. And I'm only reading it because of what he gets to next in addition to it. He says, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. But then look, he immediately adds, this mystery is profound, but I am talking about Christ and the church. So Paul, this single follower of Jesus, is saying, hey, this mystery of these temporary earthly marriages that isn't really part of my story right now. But this, this mystery of earthly marriage really points us to something even greater. It points us, in other words, to, to this heavenly marriage. So every earthly marriage should reflect the heavenly marriage between Christ and his church. So the supreme purpose of any biblical marriage is not lifelong companionship. It's not sex. It's not love even. Its highest aim of a biblical marriage is to point people to the eternal reality of Christ loving his church forever. And so my encouragement to you is we should stop viewing singleness as a temporary state before something awesome in marriage. We should view it like marriage is a temporary state before the awesomeness in eternity. That's the way it should be viewed. So what what is better than earthly marriage is eternal life in Jesus. That is better. So Jesus completes you if you're single. He completes you if you're married. Only Jesus has that ability to complete you. So here's what you may not know. If you're kind of new to church, the reason we gather like this every week, the reason we do things like Bible studies and the reason we have prayer gatherings, the reason we open the word and study and sing and pray and and gather around friendships, the reason we do things like that is because we are out to hear and obey the Lord. We're here. We're studying this so that we can hear and obey the Lord. And sometimes that is really easy. And sometimes, based on what we're talking about, that. That's really difficult for my heart to do and for me to long for that. And so the question is, well, what does Jesus tell me to do when I find it difficult to obey? What do I do? This is the way Jesus says it, and then we'll close. Matthew 16, Jesus says, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, meaning if you want to save your life and I want to make it my way and my will and I want to put my identity in anything else but what Jesus tells me, he says, if you do that, Tommy, you will lose it. It will lead to emptiness and it will be hollow. But Jesus says, but whoever loses his life because of me, meaning because you follow my will, you make it about my ways, You absorb the truth that your identity is that you're made in the image of God and I have a plan for your sexuality. If you can gravitate to that, you think you're gonna lose your life, but I promise you, you'll find it. I promise you, you'll think it would be unfulfilling. It'll be the most fulfilling. You'll think you will not be complete or whole and you will finally be whole and complete because you're centered on Jesus, not somebody else. And so I just... I just love the scriptures 
I love Jesus and I, I deeply love you. And I just pray that we listen to this today from the scriptures and that we say, yes, Lord, just show me the way. Can you stand to your feet and we'll pray over it together? God, I thank you so, so much for all that you're teaching us through the scriptures, God. Like all the, all the principles, all the characteristics about you, all the things that you call us to. God, it's, it's, it's so exciting that you give us the gift of the Bible so that we can study that over and over and over and absorb that and work through that. And sometimes, God, it's really difficult for us to, to really hear your voice among all the voices that we have in culture. And sometimes it's even more difficult when we hear your voice to obey your voice. But I pray that you would supernaturally give us the ability to do that, that we would surrender our lives and our identities to you, that we would understand very clearly why you created us, who, who you created us for, and how things like singleness and marriage all submit to our relationship with you. And so God, you've, you've built a framework here for our sexuality. Would you help us to say yes to it? Would you help us to, to not only understand it and to embrace it, but to celebrate it? And God, that in and of itself is a bit of a miracle. And so God, I just ask you, if someone here does not know you as their personal Savior and Lord, that today they would surrender their life to you and repent of sin and become a Christ follower. And for the Christians here, Lord, may we not give over to lesser identities that we are made in the image of God. And you have a plan for our lives. Thank you for that. Thank you, God, that we get to be spiritual family as a gift. And we embrace that today. It's in the name of Jesus we pray over all these things. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Amen. Would you mind to have a seat right where you are for a moment? And I just want to tell you, if today you, you just realize, I need to speak with somebody. I need some prayer. And I just want a, a friend in the gospel to be able to, to know some things that I'm walking through and to just help me. Um, any one of our leaders that are gathered up here afterward today, um, they're, they're there for you. They're there because they want to pray. They want to listen. We want to serve you in any way that we can. And so please utilize them. Uh, we, we, uh, we always pray for people to, uh, to be able to get in conversations with that are not just like surface level about the weather and about whatever. We want real substantial conversations about life and ministry and eternal things. And so if you're working through that, uh, use us up today. Use us up. Um, also, I just want to say, uh, if you're a mom, out the doors and to the left, you're going to see a really fancy table with some super fancy cookies. They wouldn't let me t- touch these cookies. They're really fancy. They're not just cookies. They're, they're awesome. So uh, we invite you to go to that table here in a minute, grab a cookie. We just, we love you very much. And, and that whole team that put that table together, we just thank God for you. So can we give it up for them, everybody? Just their, their love and care to serve you in that way. And then uh, also we have, uh, I think, a photo op out on the front deck if you want to take advantage of that. It's a really pretty day today, so, so please pose, uh, pose for some pictures and, and get together with some friends and family and your mama or your spiritual mama and, uh, and just thank God for them. Uh, maybe the last couple things that I want to, to just uh, bring, Miss Lutsenko just waved at me and I just think that's the sweetest thing. When I looked at her, she's like, hey, how's it going? Hi. Um, but all that to say, uh, we also get this really sweet opportunity today uh, to partner with one of our ministry partners, Hope Clinic for Women, uh, to help put on 15 baby showers in the next couple of weeks. And what I mean by that is uh, they, they are a tremendous ministry, and they're helping these awesome ladies walk through some difficult times. And these ladies have made the choice that I'm going to do the, the difficult thing, have this baby, but I need people to surround me and help me. And so what we're inviting you to do is you can scan that QR code or out by that cookie table. There's another QR code where Hope Clinic uh, for Women is set up. You can scan it. It takes you to an Amazon list. You can purchase one, two, three things, and it will go directly to the Hope Clinic for Women. So you don't have to run, go get anything. You don't have to do anything like that. You just scan that QR code or right afterward, you can go out there, scan it, maybe meet them. And, uh, and then just purchase uh, a gift or two for these amazing women and for the babies that they'll soon care for. So in fact, uh, I would love for you to meet uh, Elena Francisco. She's the development director at the Hope Clinic for Women. Can you give it up for her right now? Yeah. Thanks hey, Elena. for having me. Yeah. Appreciate it. Tell us a little bit about the ministry and what you got going. Yeah, absolutely. So Hope Clinic for Women is a pregnancy clinic located in the heart of Nashville. And we do three different things for our mamas. We provide full medical care for them. So women's wellness, women's problems. We offer professional counseling. And then we also offer our pregnancy program, which goes through the duration of the pregnancy and the first year after the baby is born. Uh, Y'all are partnering with us in order to provide 15 different mamas with strollers, with diapers, uh, not diapers, but with bathtubs and monitors, all those things that are just really expensive. Uh, Diaper packs that are like this big cost 50 bucks and so if our women who are uninsured or underinsured are already struggling with diapers they're probably not going to get a stroller so it's because of people like you that were able to do that so that's huge I also have a quick logistical thing the Amazon link is having a little bit of issues so Pedro was fantastic and Pedro put a sheet out there with our address on it if you do not see the address pop up then it is there on the table and we we can help you find it I love it give it up for Elena one more time y'all come on yeah Um, So she's going to be at the table out there. Side note, she lives an hour away from here, but wants to be with us all day. And in fact, her her dad, I think his name is Ben, is actually in the hospital right now. So she's she's doing a lot of things uh, in the name of Christ and, and just kingdom work. And so pray for her dad, pray for her, go out there, get to know her a little bit more. Maybe scan that QR code or pick up that paper that Pedro put out there. I think it'll be a blessing. So... Um, I think that is about it, except that today we get a, another privilege of having a child dedication to wrap up our worship gathering today. So I just want to invite Jen and Mason Howell up to the stage right now, if you don't mind. Give it up for them, y'all. And they're bringing up baby Eden. Baby Eden is a year and a half old, and um, this is awesome. I love this. This is really fun. Pastor James actually has a gift for you. 
and just some stuff from, from our kids' ministries, a way that they just want to come alongside you. But my, my two questions, that maybe you're used to hearing me ask these, but um, I just ask them pensively and thoughtfully and carefully um, just for you to commit to two things for baby Eden. Can you commit to teaching her the, the full word of God, to commit to teach her about who Jesus is, what he's done, what he's done for you and what he can do for her and, and just who he is and what his kingdom's about. Can you commit to that? If so, say we will. Amen. And then she is smiley right now and just making eye contact with folks. She's just running it. And then the second thing is just as important. Can you commit to modeling for her what it means to walk with Jesus? Not just uh, do what I say, but hey, I'm going to I'm gonna walk with Jesus, and I know I'm gonna be imperfect at this, but follow me as I follow him. Can you commit to that? If so, say we will. Yeah. And then church family, I always wanna ask you, because we don't wanna leave you out of this, uh, we observe child dedications in some ways, but in other ways we participate by saying, man, I don't know them, but maybe today will begin my first day of a long string of days praying for baby Eden, praying for them as a family. And if you say, hey, man, I, I really do want to commit to coming alongside them and other couples like them to, to pray and care and comfort and advise and just do anything I can for them to be great parents. If you can commit to that and say, we will. Amen. Amen. So I want to invite uh, any friends and family. We're going to kneel down right here. Friends, family, staff, leadership council, if you're in here as well, we're just going to gather around you and pray for Eden and for you, okay? So I'll, I'll give all of you a chance to come on up. And everybody else, we'll, uh, we'll pray from your seat. You can just have a seat right here. Amen. Amen. Yeah. I'm so glad you came. I love that. That's really special. Yeah. All right, y'all. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this precious family. God, we thank you uh, not just for um, you giving them baby Eden, but for how they want to be good stewards of parenting. Well, did they, they recognize even in these early days that uh, Eden is a gift to them, but ultimately is to honor you and to glorify you. And so, Lord, I, I love that about the, the purpose of even doing this. I thank you, God, for Eden. And right now, she doesn't quite understand who you are or who she is. Uh, she doesn't quite understand the scriptures and all that just yet, but giving her time and giving her some some nurturing time at home and with other other folks who will surround their family with the love and care of Jesus. Uh, Lord, we pray that she would hear your sweet voice calling her to yourself and that she would say yes to Jesus. And Lord, that the rest of us would help her through hard days, difficult days. We would help mom and dad through difficult days of parenting. We would celebrate the, the, the good days of parenting. But Lord, you're honored in all of them. So we just pray your blessings on them. And we definitely pray for baby Eden that your hand would be on her that she would sense your goodness and your grace the older she gets and that she would walk with you for all of her days. We love you. We love them. And we offer them to you even now. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray. And all God's people say, amen, amen. Give them a hand, everybody. Come on. Yeah, amen. 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 So um, you're dismissed, but maybe before you head out, you can swing by, just love on this family, hug their necks, and tell them you're proud of them. Have a good Mother's Day, everybody. We love you.